The 2000 legislative session is almost over. The legislators are going home in just a very few short days. Welcome to People, Places, and Politics. I'm Patty Milne. In spite of this 2015 legislative session that has not only been historic for a number of reasons, it's also been very contentious, divisive, and we might say unique. In spite of that, Nick Williams, the public policy manager with the Salem Chamber of Commerce, is here today to talk about some of the good news, good things that are happening in this legislative session. And thank goodness, because there's enough contentious stuff to go around. So thank you so much, Nick, for coming back and sharing uh, some information on what's going on at the legislature and also other, other things we'll get to that are happening at the Salem Chamber of Commerce. Yeah, you bet, Patty. It's always a pleasure to be with you. And uh, as far as good things that are happening, I'll focus on some of the bills specifically in a little bit. But one thing that is really that's been really unique about this mm -hmm. session is that uh, the way that the community, the business community that I'm involved in, and get the opportunity to serve, they've really rallied in a way yeah. that. Mm -hmm. um, that we've never seen before. It, it, and it, it started with uh, this cohesiveness of the business community and different associations and organizations mm -hmm. that historically haven't really talked very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when you start talking about the common threads such as uh, minimum wage and the way that employer-employee benefit mm -hmm. relationships are established like the, the bill having to do with mandatory paid sick leave, that's gonna that's gonna cause a great deal of cohesiveness to occur. Mm -hmm. So as far as good things happening, mm -hmm. that happened, yeah. <laughs> and the the legislators really uh, they they felt that um, I wouldn't go so far as to call it pressure, uh, but they did feel a great deal of uh, just uniform voice mm -hmm. on these mm -hmm. different things, and and uh, I, we could we could go through a whole host of different issues where. The, the legislators, the legislature and the Senate, the House and the Senate had the numbers, really the Democrats could have passed whatever they wanted to pass. Mm -hmm. uh, but and in some cases they have, but that's another they, story. They have, but in, in a lot of cases uh -huh. too, those things have been dialed uh -huh. back quite a yes. bit. Uh -huh. For example, um, now let me just preface this by saying that, that uh, our belief is that the, the government stepping in and telling businesses the types of benefits that they're to provide for their employees is not a sound practice, okay? However, with that being the case, um, paid sick leave started off with a floor of uh, six employees and one hour of paid sick leave earned for every 30 hours worked. Wow. And, and so, and the way that it wound up, at least the way I understand it right now, is the floor is 10 employees, so the business is exempt from this law if they have mm -hmm. under 10 employees, mm -hmm. and one hour of paid sick leave for every 40 hours worked. It's, not, it's nothing to brag about, but the fact that, that the needle was able to be moved yes. in that mm -hmm. way we have to take these little wins where we can. <laughs> <You're>, yes, <laughs> that's we, right. We have to have this uh, these little pieces of, of mm -hmm. encouragement every every place that we can. So um, a, a good thing to, to sum that little portion up has to do a lot with the, uh, the the cohesiveness that happened with these different groups that share interests. Mm -hmm. Moving into some of the specifics, good things that happened. Um, Oregon's airport system, mm -hmm. are, and particularly mm -hmm. our municipal mm -hmm. airport systems, are when you take a look at Oregon's versus other states, um, the city of Salem, Salem Municipal Airport is, is a good example. Um, they are a little bit more run down, and yeah. I would go so mm -hmm. far as to say not quite as safe as they are for those that fly um, recreationally or um, not quite commercially, right? So some of our charter flights and things of that nature that bring pretty significant dollars into local economies. Um, our, but, our but also, if I could um, interrupt you just for a moment, um, we talk, touched on this a little bit before we started the show, and I'm very familiar with the Aurora State Airport mm -hmm. and the amount of corporate business that's done, the, the transportation, the fact that they can fly a corporate 
airplane in. People hate to use the word jet because they envision this tremendous, huge, yeah. huge um, airplane, and they often misconstrue these corporate um, vehicles mm -hmm. with um, commercial flights. But the amount of business that um, is able to be conducted much more cost effectively and efficiently because of the Aurora State Airport located where it mm -hmm. is, particularly Wilsonville, is a huge benefactor mm -hmm. to that for those businesses located in Wilsonville and, and surrounding areas. What the businesses can do to make better business decisions because that airport is there and now the tower, um, it, it's it's a huge, huge impact on our local economy, mm -hmm. not just for the city of Wilsonville, but for Marion County and also the state. Yeah, and, and uh, that's a great example as to why yeah. <laughs> th these infrastructure investments are important. And um, in, an interesting fact is that the, the aviation or jet fuel tax in the state of Oregon hasn't been raised in 50 years, and that yeah. directly goes mm -hmm. to fund mm -hmm. uh, these smaller airports mm -hmm. that exist within our state. And <clears throat> uh, this was an interesting tax because it's one that uh, those within the aviation community were actually uh, in, a, in full agreement on and in, in favor of. Uh, business associations and groups and business people are not generally in favor of very many taxes. <laughs> it's hard enough to conduct <laughs> business today. Right. So it, it, was, uh, it was a really fascinating discussion to be a part of where you had a, a, a group of folks that mm -hmm. were directly going to be impacted by these, this additional tax uh, being in favor of it. And so uh, House Bill 2075 is uh, currently in the Senate. Um, third reading is taking place any day this week. They've got to get things wrapped <laughs> up pretty quickly. Very but uh, a lot of our, uh, a lot of the smaller chambers of commerce mm -hmm. throughout the state of Oregon had a great deal of impact and they were rallied by the Oregon State Chamber on this mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And that this was uh, a very low priority mm -hmm. bill, I would say, early in the session. But as a result of that grassroots mobilization, uh, all indicators are that it's going to uh, come to fruition and, and, and pass and Good. be signed by the governor. Good. Good. So even though it's a tax increase, but it's the direct users who wanted this to happen. And it's two, two cents a gallon. Uh, yes, think. it was a two yeah. cent a gallon tax. That's correct. Okay, and it'll raise over seven point five million dollars per biennium mm -hmm. per so infrastructure maintenance and economic development. Yeah, yeah. that's so that's it's correct. good. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. What else is happening that's a good thing? Um, other things that are happening, a good thing, uh, House Bill 2643 uh, passed its last legislative hurdle last week when the Senate approved it unanimously. Um, this bill, and I'm just reading from mm -hmm. our summary here, streamlines the application process for a local government applying for an enterprise yeah. zone and also eliminates uh, a numeric unit limit on the number of enterprise zones that may be designated at any time. These enterprise zones and, and now talk this is um, this is a fascinating one and, and I think um, some clarification on what it all means would be helpful to our audience. Well I, I'm uh, still learning about enterprise zones myself. <laughs> <laughs> so but um, what what an enterprise zone is is essentially it's a uh, it's a portion of land, if I understand it correctly, that is designated by the state that uh, can be zoned in such a way that eliminates a great deal of hurdles mm -hmm. that businesses, mm -hmm. particularly larger employers, might encounter as they're looking to build new facilities on pieces of uh, prior undeveloped land. Right. So that is uh, kind of the, the 30,000 foot view of mm -hmm. what that is. What's fascinating about House Bill 2643 is that it's one bill that um, it actually significantly streamlines an application process and eliminates, <laughs> you know, it eliminates hurdles. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Lord knows that there weren't enough bills like this that came from this session. And uh, this one, just in principle and theory, is a good one. And we're um, really happy that it passed and it actually. Uh, the Senate approved it unanimously. So, you know, again, taking little, yeah. little wins <laughs> where we can get them uh, as a business community, this one was certainly one to um, to be proud of. Good. What about Senate Bill One Twenty Nine? 
Uh, the mm -hmm. gain share, extends the gain share program. Um, the gain share program is a, uh, is a program that exists uh, that diverts state funding to local governments that provide economic development mm -hmm. activities. And it diverts those funds when uh, the, the dollars collected through mm -hmm. property taxes mm -hmm. are not sufficient to fund those economic development opportunities uh, and, and activities. This is, this is an important one because that field of economic development, so basically the recruitment of large employers mm -hmm. and traded sector employers into an area. So for example, uh, locally think uh, large commercial contractors, um, let's see, the Garmin, uh, Garmin expansion yes. was mm -hmm. uh, a result of economic development mm -hmm. activities. Um, the Home Depot uh, warehouse and distribution mm -hmm. center was an, uh, a, a direct outcome of economic development activities. So if you, if you, think, about, if you think about those significant employers not being in our region because mm -hmm. our city did not have enough funding and our mm -hmm. county did not have enough funding to uh, to fund uh, locally our economic development group is SEDCOR, Strategic Economic mm -hmm. Development Corporation. They do excellent mm -hmm. work. Uh, but, but think about our local economy without those significant employers. Mm -hmm. um, this just ensures that those activities would continue in the event that property taxes dip below a certain level within, and it's, it's not statewide, it's only as needed. And so when I think about this bill, I think about Southern Oregon, mm -hmm. right? Where, yeah. uh, you know, Jackson County and, and Josephine County, some, some of the counties down there that are really economically depressed that uh, their property tax revenue is, is very deficient uh, currently, but um, and, and, you know, they're, they're doing the best they can with the dollars that they have, but in, in order for Oregon as a state collectively to maintain a competitive, uh, to, to remain competitive at all, having these folks out there that are actively recruiting businesses, um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's very important work that, that frankly, it, in my estimation, in <laughs> our estimation, it needs to needs continue. Needs to continue. Yeah. Good. So. Um, one of the other um, items that the Oregon State Chamber of Commerce highlighted is this transportation package, and now those discussions yeah. are dead. Yeah. Is that correct, or do you think something yet might happen? No, I, I, all <laughs> indicators are that that one is, um, that that one is dead. It, it was really a, an interesting thing to watch unfold where the priorities mm -hmm, were. Mm -hmm. um, basically what this legislative session did was they planted their flag uh, on the hill of um, environmental protection and not on the hill of uh, infrastructure enhancement and improvement. Um, the transportation package or infrastructure improvement funding would have, uh, that, that was a tax that, that small and large chambers, generally speaking, were in favor of. It was one of the, legis one of the priorities that was mapped out on the uh, legislative agenda that was set forth by the Oregon State Chamber of Commerce. Um, it, what, what happened was prior to the transportation package being considered, uh, the low fuel or low Carbon. Low carbon uh -huh. fuel standards were adopted instead, and as a result, that became a very politically charged discussion mm -hmm. because those that were not necessarily in favor of the low carbon fuel standards, uh, which essentially amounted to a fuel tax, they said that they were not going to vote for two uh, motor vehicle fuel taxes, uh, tax increases in the same session. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, um, this is gonna be considered, I don't know that it will be considered during the 2016 short session. Mm -hmm. um, we're likely looking at uh, the 2017 session okay. before something like this will be considered again. And so what that means to the end user, the people that are driving on the roads, um, things like uh, earthquake 
preparedness, disaster preparedness, and just basic road maintenance and, and enhancement and improvements, there was a great slate of uh, projects throughout the entire state that were kind of earmarked had this, mm -hmm. had this funding mm -hmm. gone through, and it, it, it just didn't happen. So we're, we're really playing the, the maintenance <laughs> game right now, yeah. not the capital improvement yeah. game. Yeah. One of the that's mentioned here, and I read about it um, in the different accounts in the newspapers, is the fact that the Oregon Department of Transportation's numbers on the carbon reduction were off by 80 percent. That, that's a huge yeah. miscalculation. Yeah. What does that mean, though, in, in layman's terms? What does that mean to the average person? Well, so the reason that, that some uh, in decision-making capacities mm -hmm were in favor of the transportation package in lieu of the low carbon fuel standard uh, um, bill was because some initial numbers that were put out there by the Department of Transportation mm -hmm. stated that there were some caveats within the, the transportation package that would have reduced greenhouse gases uh, by basic, basically mm -hmm. the carbon footprint mm -hmm. of the state of Oregon. Um, th those numbers by comparison would have been about the same in terms of standards for uh, improvements in our fuels and more restrictions and things of that nature that would make our trees greener. Um, <laughs> but I say that tongue in cheek, I'm sorry. You gotta smile every once in a while. Oh yeah. But uh, um, the, the, those calculations that compared the, uh, the carbon footprint mm -hmm. between the low carbon fuel standard bill and the transportation package, it was that comparison that was off mm -hmm. by 80%. Wow. So as soon as, um, as soon as that was revealed, there again, <clears throat> a number of folks are more in favor of environmental um, policy than uh, than capital improvement policy, and that's uh, uh, that's this one was basically a non-starter as soon as that was revealed. It's a little hard to 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 um, try to um, reconcile yeah. after it's such a big so. Let's move then to, um, this is a great overview, I'm sure people appreciate that, um, to the workforce development and what's going on there. Yeah. All the great things happening yeah, there. The, the, the Salem Area <laughs> Chamber of Commerce is not entirely a political organization. <laughs> it's, it's one of our three <laughs> pathways in which we serve our members. The, um, uh, one of the areas where we uh, really thrive as an organization is preparing the workforce of five, 10, mm -hmm. 15 years mm -hmm. from now mm -hmm. um, for, uh, for entering the workforce. So part of, part of our policy making over the last 30 years or so uh, with workforce labor laws, child labor laws, things of that nature, when I was 14 years old, for example, and I'm not old, I, I'm 35, so, but when I was about 14, I, I got my first job. Mm -hmm. I worked on a farm mm -hmm. and I made money mm -hmm. and it was excellent. I paid for my own school clothes and self-sufficient. Little gas from, money when you finally got your driver's license. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so that, um, those experiences though are, uh, a, a lot of our kids that are now in that age bracket are mm -hmm. not able to have those mm -hmm. employment skills, which don't only give kids a, a chance to make money, but they also give them an opportunity mm -hmm. to uh, to learn some soft skills and what it means to be an employee, what it means mm -hmm. to show up to work on time and, and have a high level of customer service when the opportunity presents itself and things of that nature. So what, what we have done, we've partnered with uh, our local workforce development board in sight mm -hmm. And there is a program called the NET. Mm -hmm. And what the NET does is it, uh, over a period of time, it, it uh, exposes kids, not just kids, but young adults mm -hmm. ages 16 to 26 mm -hmm. that are not college graduates or not otherwise working. Um, it exposes them to the workforce and allows them basically to job shadow an intern for a period of time and then uh, after that period of time, then the employer makes the decision as to whether or not they would like mm -hmm. to hire that person. And um, it's, it's fantastic for both parties. Yeah. One, because mm -hmm. they're learning some job skills and they are being compensated. 
Uh, but then it also provides the opportunity for long-term employment in fields where there are significant employment mm -hmm. deficiencies. I mean, um, construction, manufacturing, the list goes on and on and on. There are a lot of uh, there are a lot of holes in our current uh, in our current workforce right mm -hmm. now. Uh, there's a there's a big transition toward kind of the white collar jobs and away from blue collar mm -hmm. jobs. Mm -hmm. And uh, a, a lot of that has to do with misunderstandings of what, um, what a, I guess, a blue collar job or more of a yeah. labor uh, job has to do with. And so what this does is it exposes people back to that type mm -hmm. of work so that we can fulfill those needs within our workforce. Currently, about 10,000 people are retiring from the workforce wow. every day. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And <laughs> so it, it being able to fill those, um, being able to fill those employment gaps, uh, we have taken along with Insight, the Workforce Development Board, we're really putting some boots on the ground and trying to figure out how to solve this. But the net has been a very, very uh, successful program locally, and our hope is that uh, it can become a, a model for others to, in our industry, what we call do some R&D with, meaning rip mm -hmm. off and duplicate. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what it used to mean. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the businesses, how a business, someone who's listening, a business could get involved in this, and how are the kids, these youth, these young people selected? How, how do they apply? Yeah, there uh, are. What can they do to learn more about this? I, I would suggest going to our website, salemchamber.org, and uh, there's a workforce development tab that they okay. can click on. And we have, uh, it starts off with employment opportunity fairs. Mm -hmm. And that's where we have a lot of those that are engaged mm -hmm. within the uh, areas that I just mentioned. Uh, doing some interviews and things of that nature, matching up some skills uh, that may that that these young adults may have currently, some skills or some passions with opportunities that exist, so that there aren't a lot of false hopes going into this. Mm -hmm. And then uh, from there, um, as far as employers are concerned, I would suggest an employer getting in touch with J.D. Shin. He's our business liaison mm -hmm. at the Salem Chamber. Mm -hmm. Uh, his email address is jd at salemchamber.org. <laughs> yes, give it, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that would be an excellent, excellent first step for the young adults, the website, good. or for the employers emailing JD. Good, very good. So how, ma how many um, young people are involved at any given time? We have, well, that's a good question. I want to say. Generally, roughly. It, it's, it's a young program. I want to say currently we're at about just under 50 mm -hmm. that, are, that are in the program. Um, our goal is, uh, we're not quite at our goal, but we have a pretty good period mm -hmm. of time to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, my understanding is that all the parties involved would like to extend the program, which tells me that. Uh, it's been successful and good. it's not keeping people up at night and it's doing what it was intended to do. And they will have do. the capacity. Yes. Good. Yes. <laughs> so. And you mentioned um, that they should look for a job fair coming up. Is one coming up very soon? Uh, there is. There's one later on in the month of July. I'm going to steer people toward our website because I don't have <laughs> that date memorized just yet. July. Go to the website, July. <laughs> Salemchamber.org. And tomorrow's. Well, as we tape this, it's, tomorrow is July 1st. Yes. So, good. So a lot of things have been happening at the chamber, and one mm -hmm. is um, the current CEO is moving on, mm -hmm. and there's been a search. So mm -hmm. bring us up to date. There's an okay. interim. Yeah, there inter is. Interim person. We, uh, the, the Salem Chamber, we're really fortunate. We've had some excellent leadership uh, in place for the last uh, 20 years, starting with Mike McLaren, 1995, and then uh, Jason Brandt taking his position in 2011 up until uh, currently. And Jason is young, and uh, his leadership has been recognized. He's moving on to be the uh, executive director at the Oregon Restaurant and Lodging Association. We're really happy for him. <laughs> I, this is an excellent, excellent um, uh, a thing for for Jason mm -hmm. and and his family and and for him to take his talents to kind of that larger statewide mm -hmm. platform um, and there's a search that's in in place right now and uh, we are 
looking for that next, the Salem Chamber and volunteer leaders that are involved with this process are looking for that next sharp leader to help the Salem Chamber go from the next, from where we are to the next level. Um, it's, uh, in the meantime, uh, our current Chief Development Officer, her name is Kathy Moore, and uh, she's a fantastic, wonderful leader in her own right, and she's mm -hmm. the director of our uh, leadership and workforce development efforts within the chamber, and that's where her passion area mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. I tried to talk her into being the CEO of the chamber, <laughs> but she, is, she has an excellent uh, trajectory for her area mm -hmm. of work, and she'd like to stay there, but she has agreed to be the interim CEO for the Salem Chamber. And so we're, uh, both as a team and, and our board of directors and our members, uh, feedback has been absolutely positive. And this also gives the selection committee uh, uh, an, an excellent leader to put in place uh, while Jason's replacement yeah. is, uh, is sought out. Um, I, I've been on the team at the Salem Chamber for about two and a half years. And uh, during that time, the first year, year and a half that I was on staff, um, Jason's daughter was fighting brain cancer. Mm -hmm. And as a result, uh, as he should have been, he was out of the office for cancer treatment. She was very young at the time, about two years old. She was a toddler. And uh, she is um, now healthy and she's a <laughs> four-year-old little ball of fire. She's beaten brain cancer twice. What that did though, if there is, I'm kind of a silver lining guy, so there's always a silver <laughs> lining to everything. And what that did while Jason was um, doing what he needed to do with his family, um, it allowed our team, our staff at the chamber mm -hmm. to operate without our leader in place every day. And we continued to move the needle on behalf of our members and, and we were able to demonstrate that we were able to perform at a very, very high level. Mm -hmm. And so um, we wish Jason the best, but yeah. we know what it's like when he's not around <laughs> very much. And uh, we're excited for uh, we're excited for Kathy's leadership, and a, a number of folks on our team are guided by faith, and and we believe that Jason would b have been given this opportunity to mm -hmm. serve at the Oregon mm -hmm. Restaurant and Lodging Association if the right person wasn't out there somewhere. True. So that's yeah. the update from the chair that I sit in. <laughs> <laughs> well, great, <laughs> fantastic. So in closing, um, Nick, provide once again contact information at the chamber for yourself and also the chamber at large so anyone can follow up on the discussion we've just had. Yeah, uh, our website, uh, which is recently revamped, salemchamber.org, my email address if you'd like to talk about anything public affairs or Salem Young Professionals uh, involved. Uh, my email address is nick at salemchamber.org. And uh, again, JD for our workforce development efforts, he's jd at salemchamber.org. Great. Well, thank you again so much, Nick. This is a fantastic update, and I look forward to having you come and update us again in the very near future. I look forward to it, too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. My stomach.